Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to first explain what the format of the college is. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. Second, we then have uh, our speaker who will speak. Then we shall get into our, our question and answer period. And that will be followed up by our infamous rebuttal period where you'll get a chance to comment on our off topic. We need to be out of here by 8.45 in the evening because the restaurant closes at 9. There are two rules for the College of Complexes. One is, uh, the first one is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. Our main speaker tonight is Jennifer Sobel, Executive Director. She runs the Illinois Prison Project. They work for a saner criminal justice system by using creative approaches to reducing the size and expense of Illinois' prison population. Their organization of clients, they represent clients directly and connect clients to lawyers throughout the state. They push back against excessive sentences in Illinois through direct representation, issue certification, and connecting lawyers directly to clients. Let's welcome Executive Director Jennifer Sobel with a nice, warm, rousing round of applause and a College of Complexes welcome. Hello, I'm Jenny. Thanks for having me. I am the Executive Director and Founder of the Illinois Prison Project. So I'm just going to jump right in if that's okay with you guys, and we'll start by talking about Illinois, Illinois' prison system. Um, I don't know how familiar the average person is with how many people are in prison in this state because I live in a criminal justice bubble where everyone thinks about prisons all the time. Um, but I, before I started this project, I spent my time working in the federal system, and so I didn't really think that much about who was incarcerated in Illinois. I just didn't really come across it very often. Um, but I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with the prison population data about a year ago and was utterly dismayed to learn that there are about 40,000 people in Illinois prisons. Um, does that number seem high to anybody but me? No. Seems crazy, right? Really, really high. No. Um, no? <laughs> and in a state like Illinois that is completely <laughs> broke, our prison system is costing about two billion dollars a year. That's more than we spend on almost anything else as a state. The, the other thing that I was really surprised to learn about a year ago was that Illinois doesn't have parole. No parole whatsoever. That means it doesn't matter how sick you are, it doesn't matter how rehabilitated you are, it doesn't matter if you're in a coma, there's no way for you to get out of Illinois' prison system, which is very unusual. Um, all the 13, no, 16 states have parole even the states that don't have much so shorter sentences. So Illinois are really high by it's, it's because we don't have parole, and, and we'll talk about the other thing that, that factor into it, but it's this lack of parole that has kept Illinois' prison system really, really high. So Illinois' prison population peaked in about 20, 2008, I guess, um, with um, a incarceration of just around 48,000. That's as high as it got in 2015. And in 2015, everyone said, well, this is really crazy. Um, Illinois' prison population is built, or prison system is built to hold 27,000 people. So we're way over capacity, just like <coughs> significantly over capacity. So in 2015, people sort of put their heads together, Rauner put together a commission, and they started saying, well, what can we do to drop these numbers down? And this is when everyone started to, to say, well, Low-level drug offenders. Let's keep all the low-level level drug offenders out of our prison, which is great, right? Low-level drug offenders should not be in prison. And so for a, long, for a couple of years, we very actively diverted all the low-level drug offenders out of our prison system. Wonderful, right? That should just solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. What it did was reduce the prison population by, by about 20%, from 40, 48,000 down to 40. And we have stuck. We are persistently and sort of forever stuck at about 40,000 people. And the reason that is, is because most people who are in Illinois prisons are serving very, very long sentences for violent crime. Um, now, some people feel like, well, people should do long sentences for violent crime. Except that Illinois' prison system is an outlier in the country. Our prison sentences are significantly longer 
than they are in other places, coupled with the fact that we don't have parole. If you take very, very long sentences and no way out, what do you get? You get a stagnant prison population that will never really decline. Because once you get in, there's sort of no way to get out except to die. And in fact, one in seven people in Illinois prisons right now will, will die there, has to have sentences so long that they are akin to a death sentence. So let's talk about the number of people because, well, let me say this. When I think about Illinois before I started this project, I thought progressive, blue state, sort of cutting edge, um, thoughtful about prison policies, thoughtful about sentencing. As it turns out, Illinois is one of the worst states in the country um, when we talk about long sentences. And so I want to talk about this concept of life and virtual life sentences. A life sentence is exactly what it sounds like. It's a sentence where the judge says, you will die in prison, and that's just it. Um, a virtual life sentence is considered um, among the experts in this field to be more than 50 years. And when I think, well, who's going to have the most life and virtual life sentences, I certainly don't think about Illinois. Um, and I don't know what, what you guys think, but if you were like me and thought that you would be wrong, there are only nine states in the union who have more than 1,000 people in their prison system who are doing life and virtual life sentences. Texas. New York, those places aren't like huge surprises, right? They're really big states um, with really big populations. Illinois struck me as sort of surprising, right? We are as bad as Texas, we are as bad as Louisiana, we're as bad as Florida. Except that we're actually a lot worse. So I, do, I want you to pay attention or sort of observe for a second that the cutoff number is over a thousand, right? So that means that somebody decided, the people at the sentencing policy were very, very smart, decided that a thousand was a good cutoff number. Illinois has 4,295 people in its prison system, so more than four times that cutoff number serving life or virtual life sentences. We've got 1,584 people in prison today who are serving life sentences. We have another 2,711 people who have been sentenced to more than 50 years. That's a really crazy number, especially when you think about the fact that in most of the Western world, most of Scandinavia, most of Europe, there are no sentences longer than 20 years. Every part of the civilized world has decided that 20 years is enough to rehabilitate anyone, to deter crime, and to sort of pay back a debt to society. In Illinois, we have 4,295 people who will die in prison. When people think about long sentences, they think about murder, which is understandable. They think, well, those are the crimes for which people should get really long sentences. And so just to make sure that everyone understands here, it's not that we have more murderers than we than other places. It's really that our people in Illinois are getting much longer sentences than in other places. So the Bureau of Justice Statistics is an agency run by the Department of Corrections, and they analyze sentencing data all across the country. And every couple of years, they run an analysis on the average time served for release for a whole variety of crimes. And 2016 is the most recent data that we have. And in 2016, across the country, the average sentence before release for murder was 17 years. Right? So if you get convicted of murder anywhere but Illinois, you will probably get out in about 17 years. And that has worked reasonably well for everyone. Um, in Illinois, we have almost seven, and we, almost, we have almost 6,700 people who are currently sentenced to murder, sentenced for murder. 18.6% of those people are serving life sentences. 35.7 are serving virtual life sentences. 39.6 are serving 21 to 49 years. Right, so not quite virtual life, but honestly, more than they would get in any other country in the Western civilized world. And only 5.9% have gotten sentences that are under 20 years. So that means that Everyone but five point nine. And, and the other thing to remember is that Illinois doesn't have parole, right? So in Illinois, your sentence, the sentence that the judge gives you on a murder is the sentence that you will do. So it's not like the judge says 17, you know, says 20 years and you get out of 10, or 15, you get out of 25. 
When you get sentenced for murder in Illinois, and you get 50 years, you do 50 years. That means that in Illinois, 94% of the people who are convicted of murder are doing sentences that are significantly longer than the average sentence everywhere else in the world. Everywhere else in the country, but actually also everywhere else in the world. So murder is just an example, obviously. Um, I will say that there are about 350 people serving natural life sentences in our prison public system right now who did not kill anyone. Um, for example, there are 99 people serving life sentences for armed robbery right now. Um, there are another about 200 serving life sentences for a variety of sex offenses but didn't kill anybody right now. And then another 100 or so people serving life sentences for various other crimes. Um, some of them even drug crimes. None of these people killed anyone. All of them were sentenced to die in prison. There are also sort of outlier cases. There are a handful of people who have been sentenced to 2,500 years, 1,500 years. Sentences that are so preposterous um, that to call them anything other than life is meaningless. Um, this sort of scourge of over-sentencing in Illinois has left us with a prison system that is completely overburdened and that we just, quite frankly, cannot afford. Because people are aging in prison, Illinois' prison population is now 20% elderly. There are 8,000 of the 40,000 people in Illinois' prison right now who are elderly. Um, this is important for a lot of reasons. Hold on, let me just go through. Oh. Um, that I'm gonna get to when we sort of get to the elderly portion of the, set of the presentation. Um, there are hundreds more that are sick or dying, right? So there are about 150 infirmary unit beds within the prison system right now, and so these are people who are terminally ill and need basically round-the-clock hospital level or nursing care. Um, there are many, many more people who would be in those beds if there were more beds available, right? There's a shortage of beds. But Illinois does not have medical compassionate release. They don't have medical commutation. We have no mechanism in this state to release people who are terminally ill. We have no mechanism in this state to release people who are um, dis disabled, even people who become disabled during the course of their incarceration. What this means is that we're stuck with the price tag of their incarceration, and we're stuck with the medical costs of their incarceration. Remember that $1.95 billion budget that we had last year? Over $440 million, so a quarter of that of that budget, just shy of a quarter, was spent um, was given to Wexford Health Services. Does anybody know who Wexford is? That's Illinois medical provider within the Department of Corrections. So Wexford holds our medical contract for the prison system. Um, they're currently being sued in a couple of different lawsuits. One is called Rasho um, versus, I guess now it's Jeffries. Um, which is a lawsuit about the way that we treat uh, mentally ill people within the prison. And another is called Lippert versus Jeffries, who is our new warden. Um, and Lippert alleges that the medical care within the prison system is just completely inadequate. Something like two thirds of the deaths within IDOC are preventable deaths. Um, there are any number of individual lawsuits alleging improper medical care, but this is sort of, this is the biggest class action. I'll also say that thousands and thousands of people have, who, of the 40,000 people who are in Illinois prison systems, many of whom don't need to be there, their families bear the burden of their incarceration. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room has ever had a loved one in prison or knows anyone who had a loved one in prison. Our prisons are really far flung. They're hours and hours away. They're difficult to get to. They're expensive to get to. Um, prison phone calls are expensive. Until quite recently, um, there was price gouging was a significant problem, and, and families would be charged dollars a minute to talk to their loved ones. Um, basic goods cost substantially more in prison than they do in the real world. And so, if a family member on the outside is supporting a loved one in prison, the amount of money that one needs to put on the books is quite frankly outrageous in highway robbery. And every person who's in prison who doesn't need to be is a loss to our community. Um, the elderly people who are currently incarcerated who don't need to be are not there to be grandfathers, grandmothers, or elders in their community. 
They're not there to provide child care so parents of young children can work. Um, and so, it, you know, the cost of this prison, oh, you know, outrageous prison system affects far more people than is initially obvious, and the costs are far greater than just the sort of amount of money that Illinois taxpayers pay into the Department of Corrections. So about a year ago, I was doing some policy work, and I came across the Illinois Department of Corrections population data set, which is a gigantic spreadsheet of every single person who's in the Illinois Department of Corrections. Um, and I think I stayed in that spreadsheet for like three days, because the numbers are astonishing. The number of elderly people is astonishing. The number of people serving really long sentences for crimes that you don't think warrant that kind of sentence. It's really astonishing. Um, and I started, you know, thinking about the fact that Illinois didn't have parole, thinking about the fact that judges impose these really outrageous sentences with no accountability whatsoever. And I started thinking, well, what does one do about this problem? How do we fix this, right? Because Illinois has, you know, for setting aside the outrageous injustice of putting somebody in prison for this long, um, and we're going to talk about rehabilitation in a second, we just can't afford it. Um, so there seems, you know, we have three branches of government. They are co-equal. We have the same three branches here in Illinois. And I started thinking, well, what, what can we do through our government to try to fix this problem? So I'm a lawyer. I've been a public defender for most of my career. I was a public defender in DC. I was a federal defender for a long time. I taught at Northwestern in their clinical program there, supervising students in court. And so my first thought is always judicial, right? Let's just go to the judge. We'll ask the judge. The judge will fix it. The judge will see justice. Um, that great. That works really well on an individual level. It's a really bad route for systemic change. And that's for two reasons. The first is that it is slow, right? So representing an individual person is wonderful. Rep there's no way to represent 40,000 individual people. There are not enough hours in the day, no matter how big of a legal team you had, to make a significant dent in the prison population by relitigating individual cases. The other real problem is the finality doctrine. Finality is a judicial doctrine that really protects the original conviction and protects the original sentence and makes it almost impossible to change a sentence once it's been imposed. And so for those of you who follow things like the Exoneration Project or the Center for Wrongful Conviction, um, you'll hear these stories about lawyers saying that their clients are innocent and, and sort of often cases where everyone agrees that the client is innocent and yet there is still no one willing to do anything or no one in a position where they feel like they can do anything. And that's because case law has developed over the years that, that really protects convictions. It is very hard to overturn them. And then as I was thinking about you know, a strategy for attempting to tackle this massive problem, I also sort of realized that when you're talking about an individual case, it's far, far too easy to get into a pissing match about that individual case. So you think about the, you know, the guy who says they're wrongfully convicted. If you want to say, there's a systemic problem with our judicial system and the way that we treat sentences, you probably don't want to do it in the context of a single case where you and a prosecutor are going to be pissing at each other about something that has nothing to do with this huge problem and everything to do with this individual case. So for me, I don't think the judicial approach was the right approach. So then I thought, well, legislation, sure. 36 other states have parole. Most other states have shorter sentences than Illinois. All of these programs, parole, sentencing ranges, these are all dictated by the legislature. Surely our legislature could do something about it, right? Well, you know, we have a progressive house, we have a progressive caucus, surely they'll just be able to introduce some legislation. Um, it turns out that it's not that easy. It might be possible to implement significant criminal justice reform, and there is some movement on that front in the legislature as a prospective matter. Um, some of you guys might be aware of the juvenile parole bill that was passed last year, which creates these moments for parole for people who committed their offenses before they turn 21. That's a great start. It is prospective only. So it will do nothing to make a dent in that 40,000 people up on that screen. And about 10,000 of them were convicted for offenses that they committed before their 21st birthday. 
but they won't get another crack at the apple. They will not be eligible for parole um, because the House and the Senate, for reasons that are sort of complicated and mostly made up, was unwilling to pass a bill that was retroactive. So at least for now, retroactive legislation is not a viable route, and I'm happy to talk about that more if anyone's interested in it particularly, but it not, does not strike me as a viable route for significant criminal justice reform, at least as a first step. So our only branch that's left is the executive branch, right? Unless, unless someone wants to make me in charge of something. The executive power in the criminal justice space that is really, really exciting is commutation um, and clemency. Clemency is the executive's power, of, you know, the governor's authority or the president's authority. To he could set them all free. That's actually totally right. So in Illinois, the governor has basically limitless power to change any sentence or any conviction in any way. There is no limitation on it. There is no process that has to be followed. The governor can truly do anything the governor wants. The power is stunning, but it's also very, very rarely used. Governor Pritzker has, um, he's pardoned a lot of people. Pardoning is getting rid of a conviction after somebody's already out of prison. So he just expunged all of the marijuana convictions, which I think was very exciting and made the news. He also pardoned 20 people at the same time. But every single, all 20 of those people were people who had already been released from prison. So although wonderful, it doesn't really do anything to affect this problem. So far in the year that he has been, in the just shy of the year that he's been governor, Governor Pritzker has commuted, it's either three or four sentences for people who are terminally ill. That's of the 40,000 people who are in prison. Three or four is just not, it's just not doing it, right? Because commutation is very, very rarely successful, it's very underutilized. Lawyers do not bring commutation cases unless they're doing it for money. Um, there are a couple, you know, there's the rare nonprofit that will file one here or there, but there's nobody using this tool or to use this tool in a robust way. Right, it's always for an individual client, sort of as a side thing that you do as a favor. Okay, so this combination of problems, right? The difficulty with finality before the judges, the absence of any like real movement on the legislative scene, and the fact that the governors have historically been really unwilling to commute sentences means that there are no lawyers in this space. Um, there were none at all. There was no legal organization that was like, we're going to represent all the people in prison, so almost like prison legal aid, to try to do something about this outrageous trend of over-incarceration. Um, I looked at that scene and said, well, like there's no harm to be done here, right? I'm not going to step on anybody's toes. So I founded the Illinois Prison Project back in June. And the whole point of the Illinois Prison Project is to directly represent people who are incarcerated in the context of direct representation campaigns, which I'm going to get into in a, in a second, with the only goal of bringing people home. So we are not arguing about whether or not there are grab bars in the shower. We're not talking about what books you're reading or what diet you have. If you're so disabled that you cannot safely shower, you should go home, right? If you can be safely released, you should go home. And, and that's the whole point here, because at this point, our prison system is just outrageously out of control. So our approach is really different from all of the other legal service organizations out there. We sort of combine systemic advocacy with direct representation. Our whole model is hinged on direct representation and the clients that we represent, because I'm a public defender and that's sort of what I've always done. We combine direct representation with public education, and so that's talking to groups like you, op-eds, media pushes, we'll talk about that in a second, and with systemic advocacy. So what does direct representation look like in this context? Rather than it representing one person with one claim, almost, almost all of our clients are part of strategic representation campaigns. And so what we've done is instead of saying, you know, like, Bob's serving sentence for a murder, Bob is rehabilitated, Bob should go home. We've surveyed the entire criminal justice system to identify problems that affect multiple people at once. We then come up with a solution and try to use that solution to help everyone. I'm gonna jump ahead and see what it, okay, yeah, great. So 
So we're going to use the problem of elder incarceration as an example to help you understand what this looks like. Right? Again, 8,000 elderly people in the prison system. Um, Elder incarceration is horrific for a bunch of reasons, but let's talk about them in case they're not intuitive. Elderly people cost two to five times as much to incarcerate as non-elderly people. Um, I think the reasons for that are pretty obvious. They, they Thank you. are expensive to incarcerate because of their medical needs. Um, in Illinois, the most recent data suggests that elderly people cost $70,000 a year to incarcerate. My guess is it's actually a lot higher than that. Um, sorry, just looking at my kid. Um, in, uh, yeah, you know, it's good. in other states, they've taken a variety of approaches to try to reduce the population of elderly people within the prison. And I will say Illinois has more than most states. Um, in other states, they've implemented elder parole. Um, in Ohio, they actually built a separate facility. It was so expensive that they had to close it. But here in Illinois, we're not doing much. Um, Elderly people also have the lowest recidivism rate of any group of people in, in the prison population. Um, the most recent studies have suggested that elderly people recidivate at a rate of 3%, which is insanely low, like lower than the general population just as a general matter. Um, there was a study in 2011 out of Maryland. Sorry, let me back up. In 2012 in Maryland, there was a, a Supreme Court decision, and that decision basically had the effect of releasing about 200 elderly people who had been convicted of first degree murder. Every single one of these people was guilty in the eyes of the law, and there was no sort of special, oh, you're rehabilitated, you're not rehabilitated, case-by-case -case determination. All of the people with a certain kind of conviction, all of a sudden their convictions weren't valid, so they all went home. That was five years, so actually now that was seven years ago. A group of sociologists and social scientists followed them for many years. And in 2019, put out a report finding that that group recidivated at a rate of 3%. You know, it didn't matter who they were. By the time you've been in prison for 20 years, you're just not the same person that you were. Um, I have a friend who's been in this business for a long time, and she likes to say that crime is a young man's game. And it is absolutely true. Most crime is committed by younger people. And by the time you've reached, you know, about 45 to 50, recidivism rates are vanishingly small. There was a study out of Stanford in, I believe, 2011 that found that people convicted of murder who have served substantial sentences actually recidivate at a rate of 1%. Um, so when we're talking about sort of the public safety aspect here, there is no public safety risk to releasing elderly people from prison. In fact, statewide, there would be a public safety gain. Elderly people are three, have a 3% recidivism rate, but they have something like a 20% victimization rate in prison. Elderly inmates are much more likely to be um, assaulted, uh, to have their property stolen, to be verbally abused, even to be sexually abused. So when we're thinking about um, control, correctional control, when we're talking about prison atmosphere, when we're thinking about um, the use of resources within a prison system, taking elderly people out of the prison system would not only free up really important resources that could be used for any number of things, including sort of healthcare, improving healthcare across the board, um, but would also make prisons a safer place. So if we're coming from a place where we think elder incarceration in Illinois' ridiculous elder incarceration rate is bad, what do we do about it? Oh, yeah, so we're gonna come from that place. We're gonna think cost savings is good, I will also say, I don't know what everybody's political ideologies are. I'm pretty <coughs> progressive. Um, in the bubble that I live in, people see long-term incarceration past the point of rehabilitation as sort of immoral or unnecessary or just not the nicest thing to do to another human being. And so when you couple those two things together, cost savings on the, on the right and progressive sort of callings on the left, you would think that this was a political win. And in fact, this is an area where there is broad bipartisan support. You look at um, Oklahoma and the recent criminal justice reforms there. Oklahoma is as red a state as it gets. And they just released hundreds of people. <coughs> the Koch brothers are huge investors and supporters in criminal justice reform. Um, so this is an issue that, in theory, should fly, right? Because it benefits everyone. But the question is, where do you start? When you've got 8,000 elderly people, Like, how do you even know where to begin? 
So what I did was think about, well, what are, what are the obvious objections, right? What are people going to say when I say I want to release all the elderly people, where am I going to get pushed back? So the first obvious thing people are going to say is, well, where are they going to go, right? That is everyone's first question, and it's a good first question, right? So you've got to think about where are they going to go. The second question I always get is, well, how do you know that these guys are rehabilitated? Right? What makes, you know, how do you know that they're not going to come out and kill somebody else again? Setting aside the really low recidivism rate. Um, then people often ask about their debt being repaid to society, right? And then just for like a little cherry on top, I wanted to find a group that was politically popular. Veterans! Yay, veterans! So we started with veterans. Um, veterans, even the ones in prison, are entitled to health care and other benefits from the Department of Corrections. Veterans actually also get longer sentences across the board as a general matter. In Illinois, for some crimes, it's as high as 22% longer. But everywhere um, throughout the United States, veterans get longer sentences than non-veterans. And there's a, you know, I am not a social scientist, I am not a social worker or a psychologist, but I think there's a strong inference that can be made that many crimes are sort of service related, right? They're PTSD related, they're mental health related, um, and veterans may experience some of the trauma associated with their service more intensely um, and thus commit different kinds of crimes or just be viewed differently by judges. Um, judges are also, uh, veterans are also enormously politically popular, as they should be. They've served our country, they've defended us all, um, and they, they frequently have very strong mitigation in their histories. So I went through the Illinois um, prison population roles as such as they are, and I located every elderly veteran within the prison system who is the over, over the age of 50, which is the cutoff for, I know that seems young, it's the cutoff for elderly people in the sort of prison world because of the effects of prison on the body. Um, I, found, I narrowed it down to the ones who had already served at least 20 years, and then I looked at their institutional records to make sure that we were working with a group of people who had clearly demonstrated rehabilitation. And so what I mean by that is we've looked for people who have not had serious infections in the last 10 years. And if anyone knows anything about prison life, it is very difficult to go any length of time without some sort of infraction. Um, but most of our clients haven't had any in a very long time. And we've looked for people who have really um, engaged in something productive during their, their time in, in custody. So many of our clients are um, very well educated at this point. Many of them have very long work histories within the prison. Some of them have become ordained um, leaders in their religious faiths. Many of them are really amazing artists. But every single one of our clients has really um, spent the last 20, or in many cases, much, much more, years of their incarceration doing something productive. So at the end of that process, I have 120 clients. Um, and so now the question is, well, what do I do with these clients, right? How am I going to, like, get anywhere with them? And so I want to bring us all back to commutation, right? Commutation is that limitless power that the governor has to, like, literally just, like, snap his fingers. He can snap his fingers and let them all go home tomorrow. He can snap his fingers and bring him before. So I, you know how I said we have no parole? Illinois used to have parole. They abolished it in 1978. So everyone convicted before 1978, of which there are still about 100 people, appear before what's called the Prisoner Review Board, which still functions as a parole board, and which still lets people out, which is important to remember. Because one thing the governor could do is take my 120 elderly veteran clients and send them to the parole board, who could make a very individualized decision about whether or not they should go home. But at least that would create a mechanism, would create a path. Um, so it's totally limitless. It's also really politically responsive, right? Um, in a way that an individual judge might not be. But you can imagine a world in which, with enough political support, all of a sudden the governor feels compelled to do something about this 120 elderly veterans who have served our country and are now literally rotting away in prison. So now we're building the campaign, right? So we've decided on a group of, of people that we're going to help, and we have to build the campaign. We've identified the clients. Um, I spent all summer gathering documentation for each client. So that's their case records, their court records, their medical records, all their accomplishments, their artwork, their families, everything. 
I've, I'm in the process now of pairing every single one of those 120 people with lawyers from the big law firms downtown. So we have a couple of very big law firms that have quite generously taken on our cases. And they're going to write individualized parole plans and individualized commutation petitions, petitions for each one. We internally and with some other allies are writing sort of master documents. So if you think about this as like a class action where there are arguments that apply to everyone, we're going to build those out. And in the meantime, we're going to be building out support from our political allies. So when you think about allies, um, I'm thinking now about legislators. I'm thinking about state's attorneys. Um, we've had a lot of talks with the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, which is different from the federal Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, but that agency is very politically uh, persuasive. They're very well respected. And they also very deeply believe in this mission. Um, by the time that we file this thing, we will have you know, letters of support from across the political spectrum is our hope. So the second piece of that, while we're sort of doing this big campaign and doing all the legal work associated with the big, campa big campaign, is building um, support within the public. So this is public education. And in my, you know, I'm again, I'm not a policy lawyer. I am not an advocate. I'm a public defender. So my experience in this part, this realm is a little bit different. But for me, it seems like there are three big areas that we've, we've been successful and should continue to build out. One is op-eds. So these are opinion pieces that we've, we've been placing in various um, publications. One is pitches, media pitches, so that the public understands, sort of not from me, but from a journalist, the, the scope of this problem. And then the third is working with allies at public events like this. So for example, um, we've been running stories in the Tribune. That's me. That's Bill Ryan. You guys should all know Bill Ryan. I mean, you might not know Bill Ryan. Everyone ought to know Bill Ryan. Um, he's a prison rights advocate and a death penalty ab abolitionist. Um, we've placed op-eds in a variety of publications at this point. We've also done media pitches. We, you know, we've, we've taken a couple of test cases and gotten a couple of guys out individually in order to sort of generate some media support and some public education support for around the issue of elder incarceration. And we spoke, we, I, I guess I, I've spoken on panels um, across the state to try to help people understand just how devastating elder incarceration is here. So the last piece is systemic advocacy. And that means working within the system to help educate policymakers and lawmakers and other public officials um, about the harm that they're doing. And I say that because to be honest, most people don't know, even public officials. Most public officials I've talked to, including representatives and senators, don't know that we don't have parole. You know, when, when they don't know what's going on, it's impossible for them to fix it, right? When they don't understand the cost that the system is having on everyone, it's impossible for them to do anything. And so we are doing our best to educate everyone within um, the state about uh, just how egregious and costly and inhumane our current incarceration model is. So we've been talking to the Department of Corrections and um, an interesting thing about the Department of Correction is there is a statute in Illinois that lets them, lets the department release people who are over the age of 55 for the last 12 months of their sentence. So with the stroke of a pen, they could reduce the population by, I mean, it's only by about, about a thousand people tomorrow. They could do it, and, and they could keep that population up, down about a thousand people every year for the rest of time. But they haven't implemented it. There's a really good reason why they haven't implemented, they just haven't done it. So we've been in talks and meetings with them and writing policy papers to help urge them along so that they do some things that benefit individual people but also um, help their bottom line. We've been in talks with the governor's office and within, who's obviously very important when we're talking about computation, those are really early. Um, and more with the lieutenant governor at this point. Ooh. Um, We've been building support within within um, the legislative branch with individual legislators, and we'll hope to continue to do that. We hope to work with the Department of Aging because these people are there just as much as our clients are the constituents of the Department of Veterans Affairs. They are the constituents of the Department of Aging. 
And we've been talking some directly with state's attorneys because part of the thought process here is that in order to, this, to, to help this problem going forward, state's attorneys need to be thinking about what it means to impose a 60-year sentence on a 20-year-old. They need to think about the fact that that means that that person will get out when they are 80 and whether or not that's really, really necessary. So our hope is, is that by combining direct representation, public education, and systemic advocacy, that we can have some serious change, change that the community has not yet seen. And I guess we'll see if it works. Um, elder incarceration is one of our biggest issues. It is not our only issue. Um, compassionate release is a big one. Again, Illinois does not have compassionate release. I have a client who died while his commutation petition was being driven to Springfield. It was ridiculous. Um, he was a four-time Purple Heart Vietnam veteran who had been sentenced to life on an armed robbery. Life on an armed robbery. The weapon was probably a can of mace. And this man, who had four children and was in college, was sentenced to life. Um, very frustrated with that, I worked with a couple of other allies and wrote a bill. It's been introduced by Will Gazzardi. Um, it's not past LRB yet, so you can't see it yet, but there will be a bunch of stuff happening in the next two months to try to get that through. Illinois could save a ton of money immediately by letting people who are terminally ill die at home. My client, Joe Coleman, had prostate cancer and dementia and had been sort of stuck in a hospital bed for months. Uh-oh, your computer died. So I'm just going to wing the rest. It died? It did. Oh, hang on. Another campaign that we're bringing now and that we hope to file in April. No, 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 it's fine. I'll just... All right, I'll uh, turn off the picture. Another issue that we're working on now and hoping to bring in April is a campaign on behalf of seriously mentally ill clients who were prosecuted for conduct that they committed while they were in solitary confinement. Right now, it should be so Illinois had this charming habit of putting severely mentally ill people in solitary confinement sometimes for decades. Um, and I don't know how much anybody here knows about solitary confinement, but it's torture. It's torture and people, even people with the strongest mental constitution will break down in solitary confinement. Because Illinois Department of Correction was not properly treating people with severe mental illness, they were frequently decompensating and thus lashing out. And rather than treating them, IDOC would put them in solitary. Once they were in solitary, there was one prison in particular that would prosecute them for things like spitting. So if a, a severely mentally ill people, person who was in solitary confinement for 10 years, because that's a pretty common number actually, um, spat on a guard in Pontiac Correctional Center out of Livingston County, Livingston County would prosecute that person. And then they would prosecute them again, and then they would prosecute them again, and again, and again. I had one client who's now out, thank God, who was prosecuted 17 times. And by the time it was all said and done, he'd been sentenced to an additional 117 years in prison for spitting. If you spit on somebody on, out in the world, it's a misdemeanor. If you spit on a guard in a prison, it's a felony. If it's your third, you're eligible for an extended term. I have a client right now who is still in custody who's doing an additional 68 years for spitting on guards. One of the sentences was 14 years. So that seems wrong and seems like something we should fix, and the Livingston County State's Attorney is not that amenable to fixing it, you know, as perhaps I shouldn't have been that surprised, and yet I still was. And so what we've done is we've identified every single person who was prosecuted for spitting or low-level assault, so just pushing and hitting. No injuries, no weapons, no fires, nothing like that. This is just <laughs> low-level stuff. We've found every single one, and we've with some help with some partners, we figured out which ones are severely mentally ill. And severely mentally ill and mentally ill are different in IDOC. Severely mentally ill is a designation, which says two things. One, it says that this person is really very ill, schizophrenic, bipolar, very psychotic, very, very ill. And two, it says that the Department of Correction knows it, right? Because they've designated it in their file. Um, and we're in the process now of 
uh, putting together commutation petitions for about 100 people who fall in that position. Collectively, they've been sentenced to thousands of years of, in, of custody. Many of them should have been out decades ago, and we hope to file that soon. Um, just like with the elder incarceration, we are building support from allied groups. We are quietly working with a couple of investigative journalists from the Tribune who will hopefully file a story to coincide with our filing. And we will be working with the Department of Corrections to the extent that they are amenable. Our other campaign, which we just got funding to bring, which is so exciting, is to help that those 99 people who are doing life on armed robbery. So I have a client who was sentenced to life on an armed robbery. He was a Vietnam veteran. He won the Medal of Valor, I think. He's a wonderful guy. He got convicted in 1984 because he decided to go to trial. He got a life sentence. Silly decision to go to trial. He should not have done it. Uh, but that doesn't mean he should have gotten a life sentence. Um, and before he left office, Governor Rauner commuted his sentence to life with parole, which does not exist in Illinois, but hey, it worked. And so he came home. We went before the parole board. They released him unanimously. <coughs> he came home in November. There will hopefully be a fairly big sort of human interest piece about him in the Tribune, so look for it. His name is Sherman, he's delightful. Um, but that left 90, actually, should, there were 99. Joe Coleman was one and he died. So now there are 98 people serving life, um, natural life for armed robbery in Illinois, and we hope to bring a similar campaign to them. So join us. You can volunteer, you can donate. We are always looking for help. We are brand new, we are six months old. Um, we have, two full-time staff. We're hoping to bring on a third. We have a lot of really committed volunteers, but we can always use some support. You can contact me anytime at my email address, which is easy to remember, or at our Facebook, our, at our website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We don't have anything else. That's all I have. And that's all I got. All right. Are you all right. All right. It's not question and answer period. I'd like to ask you the first question. Can you give us a little bit more background? I, I know you talked about the prison project, the reasons why you came in. Can you just give us a little more background about yourself and maybe introduce your son here real quick? Come on up. Sure. Hi. Okay. I'm Jenny. You know that. Um, this is Elliot. My son. He's eight. Um, loves Minecraft. Mom welcome to the beach. And two dogs. Um, okay. Uh, so I have always been in the criminal justice space, and I've always been sort of rep my whole career has been representing people. Um, who were indigent or had no other representation. All right, well, let's give order again, please. Order, order. I grew up in Detroit. I went to Michigan for college. I went to Yale for law school. I clerked for a judge, which my judge was lovely. Clerkships are not that interesting, but my judge is wonderful. And then I moved out to D.C., and within a year was at the Public Defender Service there, which is the best public defender service in the country. It's a really amazing place to learn. Um, I stayed there for about five years until family brought this little one into Chicago. So I spent a year at Northwestern teaching in their clinic doing juvenile um, representation, um, both juveniles in juvenile court and juveniles in adult court. That was my only sort of brush with the Illinois justice justice system um, until now. I, within the year, was so fed up with Cook County that I decided I couldn't, I just like didn't want to work in that system. So I went to the Federal Defenders in Indiana. And I practiced there for about four or five years, um, which was great, but got sort of wrote. Federal prosecutions are very, it's a lot of the same. And so I went and did policy work for about a year. Um, maybe a year and a half, mostly on progressive prosecutor issues. And that's when I had this sort of mental space and time and reason to think about Illinois for the first time. And so we were sort of looking into thinking about something related to Illinois. And I, um, I opened up the Department of Correction data site one day and could not get the numbers out of my head and spent, you know, lay awake for a couple of weeks and then sat down one morning, February 1st, 2019, 2018, 
and wrote a proposal for this organization. And it took a couple of months to sort of get up the verb, but by June we were founded. Good. Yeah. No camera, no camera. Okay. Please, no camera. Uh, I have a question, please. Can you tell me, mm -hmm. or, or witness, uh, how many people you personal, did you come, how many people you personal to let them get out? You, person. How many people have I got since I started this organization? Yeah. Three have gotten out since June. How many? Three. Since June. Actually, we started taking cases in September. So three since September. Um, obviously, during the course of my career, hundreds. Um, and my, the cases that I have always found the most rewarding were the cases, hey, buddy, sorry, um, are the cases where I've helped somebody leave prison after a long period of incarceration who didn't expect to go home. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been only a handful of people like that. And part of the reason is because, as we sort of talked about, the mechanisms for that kind of representation don't really exist. And so this model that we, we are using, I made it up. And I don't know if it's going to work, but we'll find out. And one more, if I may, very quickly. Uh, so how long time was it take since you was uh, applying petition for the release? How long it's a period of time? How long? Yeah, there's months, no... Two months, a couple of weeks, how many? There's no deadlines. And that's the thing to understand about commutation. When, when mm -hmm. I say it is limitless and infinitely flexible, it's because there are no rules. And so our, I know, right? Isn't that upsetting? Our hope is to file the severely mentally ill campaign in April. Um, and I don't know when we're going to get a result. The veterans campaign will be filed probably next October. It's going to take a lot longer. And I don't know when we're going to hear. I just, you know, there are no rules. OK. Mm. All right, uh, which one? Yeah. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Ellen Corley. I am very active with the Alliance Against Racist Political yeah. Oppression yeah, yeah. and uh, CPAC. Ted Pearson? Yes, so uh huh. Ted gave me Sherman. Oh, right, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. They've been doing it for 45 yeah, years. Sure. And, um, <coughs> you know, so um, it's so exciting. I, I'm glad, here? yeah, I'm coming up with a question in a second, okay? Um, <laughs> they, um, <laughs> One, I guess, one question or idea is, I mean, like you, I'm trying to figure out, you know, why has this been so hard? Today, I was talking with Bob Fioretti. He's running against Kim Fox. And, um, and so I'm thinking, can they be trained? Can you train the, um, or have a debate with the, the district attorney um, people? But it, it seems that the system, there's a lot of resistance. And um, I wish there was some kind of, oversight, human resources, uh, that that really does best practices across the states. I mean, it, it seems that this this shouldn't be like this, yeah. right? Um, yeah, okay. It's a, it's a really deeply entrenched and systemic problem. And although I'm very happy about the progressive prosecutor movement, that movement is not enough to fix this problem, in my opinion. Um, progressive prosecutor movement. I hadn't heard of that. The progressive prosecutor movement is the sort of political movement that has been formalized in a bunch of different ways to elect progressive prosecutors. Thank you. Fox is wonderful and in many ways a poster child of that effort. Um, progressive prosecutors have done a lot to, you know that initial decline in, pros in population from 40,000 to 40,000? in 2015, that, that was a result of prosecutors not bringing new low-level offenders into the system. And that's been great. But we have in many ways stalled out, right? Um, progressive prosecutors have been far less inclined, with the exception of um, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia. Progressive prosecutors have had a much harder time with retroactive application of progressive ideologies, right? So have had a much harder time releasing people from prison who are under who have already been harmed by these regressive, punitive, sort of nonsensical policies. Excuse me. Yeah, the, have you uh, any ideas about prosecutorial okay. immunity and challenging that? That's something we Yeah. Could, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't I don't think that's gonna work. <laughs> I'm not an expert in, in prosecutorial immunity in nineteen eighty three law generally. Um, but these are not, these are not, that's not what the legal, a legal challenge like that wouldn't get you anywhere. I mean, in part because these sentences are lawful. They're horrendous and immoral, but they're lawful. 
every single one of them. Well, that's, a lot of them are innocent right. people, right? Um, you look into all that innocence. Okay. Yeah, I think innocence is a red herring. Right, let's yeah. let's move on. Okay. So, some of the things that I've read about what you talked about, where prisons are located. Uh -huh. says that prisons are employment possibilities for communities that are underserved by businesses and you know other kinds of employers so that's one of the reasons I think and others that prisons and the system exists and you're going to have a tough time getting the legislators from those areas to support letting people out because then the prisons will close and people will be unemployed. I totally agree with you. No, but I mean, is it, do you, have you encountered that? We haven't encountered it yet because most of our allies are based in Chicago. Uh -huh. um, however, we've, are, we've been thinking about how to approach the Correctional Officers Union, which also, it, it's a union that um, also represents nurses and doctors. Mm -hmm. And so there is sort of possible avenues there. I do, I hear you. I think it's a real problem. I think it's going to be a hurdle. I don't, I will not capitulate to allow people to make livings off of the backs of the incarceration of other people who shouldn't be incarcerated. I hear you. It's a, it's a hurdle, but I don't, I don't think it's, um, and it's one we'll have to overcome, but it, it feels invalid to me. Not, not to say it's not real. It just feels like a. I'm not. A, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. But it's the political reality. Sure. You're not. We're not going to get every single legislator on board. With right. This. You know, we're just not, and that's okay. All right. Next. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Shawshank Redemption. The board would uh, the way they said it that they would uh, an inmate who wants to be who wants to be released, they, they wouldn't commute a sentence. But those who don't want to be released, they would commute it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You sure. saw the movie, right? I did see the movie. It's a federal prison. It's a movie. Yeah, it's a movie. <laughs> it's a movie. Yeah. I think that's a really important thing to remember. It's a movie. Um, you know, at least in, in the way computation is currently set up in Illinois, with the exception of the death penalty and these sort of broad computations, people apply, right? And so we have 120 elderly veterans in our program. We found 100 and 30, 10 people didn't want to participate. That's fine, they don't have to. We're not looking to kick anyone to the curb who doesn't want to be out. I will say, it is, I have never spoken to someone in person who said, I don't want to go home. It's just never happened. Okay, uh. Who okay. Kate? Anybody, yeah, you in the back. I have no idea if Blagojevich is going to get pardoned. I don't know. He's serving way too long a sentence for us. His sentence is way too long, but they're all way too long, right? All of these sentences are way too long. But he got the same as a murderer. He got 14 years, and a murderer gets 17 years. What is that? No, he shouldn't have gotten that much time. And to be honest, in Illinois, everybody who gets sentenced for murder gets more than 20 years. And they shouldn't get that much time either. Yes. Yeah, uh, in your opinion, let's take murder for an example, which okay. is probably next to treason, the worst thing a person can commit. Uh, what would you consider to be a, in your opinion, an acceptable range of time to be served for uh, murder? I'm not talking about accidental murder. Uh, where I get into a fist fight with this gentleman here and uh, I kill him, not intending to. I'm talking about premeditated murder, first degree murder. What do you think would be, a, a, a now that we don't have the death penalty anymore, uh, what do you think would be a uh, sufficient length of time for that type of an offender to serve and then eventually be released back into society <laughs> Well, so I'll tell you what they do all across Europe, which is that the longest sentence anyone can get for anything is 20 years. And there's a lot of wisdom in that, in that kind of sentence. And part of it comes from the, the idea that everyone is a redeemable human being. And if you give someone a sentence where they're going to come home, all of a sudden we have incentives to treat them like human beings to educate them like human beings, to make sure that they have the tools that they need to be a successful member of society, which is not something we do right now in our prison system because it's just so overpacked. <laughs> so Mark Maurer from the Sentencing Project wrote a book called The Meaning of Life, which is wonderful and thoughtful um, and everyone should read. 
where he makes the case that 20 years is enough in every case. And I will say that I, at this point, have spent a lot of time with people in prison who have served substantial periods of time, and none of them are the people that they were 20 years ago. No. I'll follow up if I may. What about the victims uh, of these, uh, uh, these the, the victims of the person who was killed? Sure. Uh, is there no consideration to be given for the people who have lost loved ones uh, by this, you know, mad act, and then all of a sudden you want to turn them loose after 20 years? The morning lasts a lot longer than 20 years. I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna say turn them loose, right? I'm not gonna use that because I think the idea is that if we really if we give reasonable sentences, we all of a sudden are incentivized to create meaningful release plans and re-accept people as part of our society, which doesn't mean they're just like unfurled into the street. So one real problem right now with our current criminal justice system is that we give a lot of voice to the crime advocates who scream really loudly, right? But we give we pay almost no attention to the vast majority of crime victims' rights, um, even of crime victims, even in their own cases. So you talk to crime, crime victims, and I do a fair bit of that, and most of them will say, well, nobody even asked me what I wanted. And I wouldn't, if I you know, had a chance to think about it and talk about it, I wouldn't have wanted life. Um, restorative justice is an incredibly important movement in, in many parts of the world, and it's becoming more and more prominent in Chicago. And it's... Uh, a practice that helps bring, to the extent that everyone wants to, right, it's premised on willing participation, but it brings crime victims and offenders together for sort of real reconciliation, real moments of, of um, reconnection. Because putting somebody in prison doesn't, you know, no matter how long you put someone in prison in for, that crime victim is not coming back, right? The decedent is never coming back. Doesn't matter if the murderer gets 20 years or 80 years or 100 years or life or the yeah. death penalty. Nothing is bringing anybody back. And so this idea of sort of restoration, that's not, that's not going to happen, right? The question is, is there anything that we can do to make the crime victim feel sort of restored and at peace? And I, I just reject as a policy matter the idea that throwing people away for life is the right answer. It shouldn't matter who your crime victim is, right? So when you look at the death penalty throughout Oh, I think it's Oklahoma was one of the places where this was a real problem. The, the greatest predictor about whether or not you get the death penalty is not your own race, it's the race of your victim. Right? If you kill a white person, you're much more likely to get the death penalty if you kill it than if you kill a black person. And that's because our criminal justice system, as horrific as it is, values some lives more highly than others. That shouldn't be the case, and we should not condone a system that allows for that. And so, you know, I often think about this when I think about sentencing. Judges are not allowed to preside over cases where they have an interest, right? They have to be unbiased. And if a judge knows somebody in the proceeding, the judge has to recuse themselves. That's because we want our policies to be dictated by people who are sort of emotionally impartial, right? Who are thinking about this calmly and with a cool head. And this is in no way to diminish the pain of any victim. But I don't think that because a victim is upset, that that should change what the sentence is. OK. Um, yeah. Um, is there, uh, do you have, or should there be some kind of omnibus bill you have for each category, showing more or less you know, what you think should happen, mm -hmm. and uh, what, the, um, um, what the consequences would be by other experience, and the cost savings? I mean, you know, if you had an omnibus bill yeah. showing all of this, yeah. that you present it to all the legislators, try to get newspapers, because it seems what you mainly need is backing. So there are other groups that do legislative work, and there are lots of them. Um, and they, there are omnibus bills that are floating around. There are sentencing reform bills. Well, there one comprehensive bill. Yeah, there are, there are, there's, there's some suggestion that there will be a sort of massive sentencing reform bill this session. I don't generally do legislative work. It's not my lane. Yeah, but it would seem that you should have out a uh, something that is uh, a guideline for them, you know, so that they have it, yeah. and you give them their arguments. Yeah. You know, they, they're not arguments really, the reasons. Yeah. Because, um, uh, like you say, a lot of them seem to be ill-informed, mm -hmm. and people are. Mm -hmm. There are other groups who are doing that, and, they, and that's exactly I've what they I've never seen doing. one. They, so a lot of um, systemic advocacy happens sort of behind the scenes. 
Right. Well, that, that's what you don't want. Yeah. Well, again, that's, you know, we are really focused on helping individual clients and using this, this model. Yeah, there but are, like you said, individual clients will never get you any place with this many people. With this model in mind? There Probably are, even lawyers should not be involved. It should just be a, a board. People think, well, the guy with the better lawyer will do it. Everything's being filed at once under the auspices of us, so they're all going to get the same, right. same yes. thing. Right, that sounds good. Okay. Yes. Next. Uh, what about the cases that we hear too often, early parolees, especially cases like rape, some of these guys that get 15, 20 years, they get out of early, early uh, release because they're good behavior, they're out at 8, 9, uh, and about a year later we hear the same thing happening all over again. What do you do with people like this? I mean, you say they're in jail too long, we don't have, they're present overpopulated, you leave them out in the street, what are you doing with them? So what you don't hear about are the like thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are fun. Right? You don't hear about the thousands and thousands of people who get paroled, and none of, no one's getting paroled in Illinois, so like these are these are in other places. You don't hear about the people who get released and don't reoffend, because it's, that's not news, but it is the majority of people, right? The majority, if, you know, it's funny that you bring up rape. The group of people with the lowest recidivism rate is sex offenders, and there has been one, there was one journal article where somebody made up one thing it was made up it was sort of it's sort of like the um um autism vaccine connection right it's oh. not a real thing it's just a thing that has captured the public attention and now everyone thinks sex offenders are going to recidivate but what you what you what you're what, what what you're not thinking about are the thousands of people who don't right and so the question is do we make public policy based on the one bad case or do we make public policy based on the vast majority of cases? So, for example, I know someone with a debilitating shrimp allergy. Shrimp, dead, right? Do we ban shrimp for the world? Probably not, right? We've, had, we've heard too many, this happens too many times. This, this is a, a, a case. Now, a murder is one case where a person will probably will not come in again. It was probably a, a passionate thing he did. They probably will not do that again. Even, uh, but about rape or other crimes, most likely they will do. So again, listen to what I'm saying very carefully. Sex offenders have the lowest recidivism rate of any category of offenders. Really. I'm happy to like direct you to the research. They really do. Yeah. Okay. Um, do, do you, uh, I'm looking for a, a, a national ban on giving life imprisonment yeah. to, um, to children, people who committed crimes before the age of 15. I think that would be a start mm -hmm. for a ban on on uh, the death penalty, or the, a ban on life imprisonment. I'm not sure that that would be the well, place to start. That's not, it's already, there already is a national ban on that. Well, um, there was a case called Miller versus Alabama. Well, okay, but, but uh, I'm actually quite offended by your saying that you think that innocence is a red herring because um, I do not think innocence is a red herring and there are place, there are cases of innocence. Uh, and I have a friend who's in jail, has not seen the light of day since he was 15 and now he's in his 30s. And uh, uh, he was innocent, I'm telling you, whether you believe I, it or not. Oh, I believe you. I believe you. And I don't say, I'm not saying that innocence is a red herring because it doesn't happen. What I'm saying is that most of the 40,000 people in prison aren't innocent, right? Some are, but the sort of, what I'm saying is that it distracts from meaningful and substantial criminal justice reform that has to happen, right? Because what it does is it bifurcates innocent people from everybody else. And it almost suggests, and I'm not saying you're suggesting this, but it is easy for people who are not inclined to be reformers. It makes it easy for them to say, well, we'll fix the, we'll get out the innocent people, but everybody else can just like stay put for life. And, and I think that's part of where the injustice comes in. I will also say that if you are a friend who went in at 15, your friend who went in at 15 is eligible for resentencing under a case called Buffer, and so hopefully someone's already reached out and he's already gotten resentenced, but you know, because I don't know. Um, if his sentence were more in keeping, with the sentences that are imposed in other states, he'd already be out of innocent or not. Well, right? he's in Michigan. Oh. He should still be resentenced, and he should be eligible for parole. Has, but has un happened. under Miller, so Miller versus Alabama, I guess there is some question about whether, anyway. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Let's go here, because yes. he hasn't had a question yet. 
Yes, yeah. so my question to you is, what did you think of the decision made by the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky to pardon all those people? I thought it was great. It was, I thought it was fantastic, and I think I would, I think more governors should be doing exactly that. Charlie, in the follow back. up to that question, if I may. All right, yeah. yeah. Can you guarantee that all of those people who were politically released by that governor using that. his powers, can you guarantee that none of those jokers are going to reoffend again? Yes, I can it, guarantee wait, you could Right, in the same way that I can't offend, like guarantee that none of you jokers are going to reoffend again. I can't, I can't guarantee what anyone's <laughs> going to do. But I will say that in the same way that, that statistically their recidivism rate is pretty on par with everybody else's, right? They are no more likely to reoffend than anybody, right? Charlie, you have a hand back there. Okay, Charlie. Yeah, Jennifer, I heard that, that the word on the street was, and this goes back a little bit, but the word on the street was, if I plug somebody, I'm going to end up with four to eight years. The mandatory minimum for murder, for first degree murder in Illinois is 20. Um, if it's if you and do it with a firearm. in the real world. Yeah, me too. When you do it with a firearm, it's another mandatory 25. So if you kill somebody with a firearm, the mandatory sentence is 45 years. People who commit murder are not eligible. No one's eligible for parole. We also got rid of good time for people who start, who get convicted of murder, so they do day for day. So that's not true. And as we talked about, the real world sentence for murders in Illinois, only 6% of those, 5.9% got less than 20 years. What about charges other than murder? Our sentences are egregiously high. Yeah. Yeah, you said about how in Europe no one served more than 20 years. I said, in most of the Western world, the max sentence you can get for an offense is 20 years. The only trouble with that, you look at that case in Norway about that guy that slaughtered all those kids. Again, that guy is not the most, most people are not that guy, so we don't want to make public policy. Yeah, but there's always going to be those guys. Yeah, no, Some people no, no. deserve the life sentence. But then we should lock up everybody because who knows who might reoffend next. Like, we should all collectively go to prison. Yeah. You know so what I mean? Yeah. There should be some yeah. reason. Yeah. This is the here. Oh. You know, we, yes. Okay, who's next? What, why are there so many minorities in jail? Don't, don't you think there's, a lot of them did commit the crime? Or is so it just 66% of the people in, in Illinois prisons are black. Our black population, I think, is 14. Latino, too. No, 66% are black. Another, I don't remember the statistic on, on Hispanic people. 14% of our statewide population is black. It is a combination of horrific economic policy, which has led um, black people to be in situations where they have to do things that are illegal to, to support themselves, and over-policing and over-prosecution of people who grew up in those neighborhoods. That's it. Um, that's all it is. It's literally nothing else. That's all of it. Uh, maybe I missed it, but um, in all your talk, uh, is there a, a reason why is Illinois the one state where we don't have parole? What's the reason behind it? Yeah, we're not the only one, but we are. But mo yeah, there are others that don't. Um, we abolished it in 1978 as part of a sort of, it's funny, we abolished it in 1978 as part of a sort of truth and sentencing moment and also because the prisoner review board at that time um, was not good. They were not doing it great job, there there were significant allegations that they were racist, sort of everybody thought that this system wasn't good because there was no way to sort of understand how much time you would actually do. I don't think if anyone had realized what the ramifications of that abolishment would be, that anyone would have wanted it. This is an unintended consequence of policies that people thought were good at the time. Is, is our legislation going? Are they beginning to think about overturning this now? Yeah, parole bills have been introduced. Rita Mayfield introduced one last year. She's going to introduce another one this year. There will be, I think there will be an elder parole bill reintroduced this year. Sure. Um, yep. Who's introducing the parole bill? Rita Mayfield, I think, is reintroducing one. Um, <coughs> Will Gazzardi is introducing the medical parole bill that I wrote. There is some suggestion that another legislator will introduce another one, but I'm not positive yet who that, that person will be. And that will be on elder elder parole bill, I believe. 
Ellen had a question. You, you have yeah. received, I, uh, two, uh, one is about, I heard that innocence, the estimates are between one third to one half, maybe of Chicago, but they, they can't count. Is there, a, you've got all the data, is there a way to actually count who is innocent? I mean, I, I get the feeling that you can't, that there's no way to know, but um, do you know that? You know, innocence is not my lane. Um, my, the last thing I read estimated at a 5%. Right. There you go. Oh, you, so yeah, you hear 12% or something. Yeah, I, I, I would be very surprised if it were there. Just, right. You know, honestly. Um, but there's no database. What's the name of that database you found where there really is a lot of, it's, I'm a market researcher. It seems like there ought to be data, complete, so, comprehensive, transparent data of police and prosecutors. The problem with innocence, right, is it's often the person in prison saying they're innocent and everyone else right. saying they're, they're yeah. not. So but just all the facts and details of a case, because it's, as a scientist, you can't even figure it out, right, no, or develop policy. There's no way to outrage. There's no way to gather that data, right, because how do you decide if someone's innocent? Is it just the number of people who say they're innocent? And then. There would have to be a survey, I guess, of all the people in prison. That doesn't exist. Yeah, survey. And what about the, also, when did it go to the states? Is there any way that you, criminal <laughs> justice is, is federal rather than, it seems under, that a lot the, of dirt is done at the low level. States. Under the 10th Amendment to the Constitution, the criminal, the power to regulate sort of crime has always been within the states. In fact, the federal system still pretty old, but it's the newer system and is mostly authorized by Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. So for example, if someone burglarizes your home, but doesn't do so in a way that affects interstate commerce, there's no way for the federal prosecutors to prosecute you. It's a state matter. It's only if you do it with a gun that cross state lines does it all of a sudden sort of fall under the rubric of anything the federal government could be involved in. So criminal laws always in a state matter. Charlie. Yeah, Jennifer, I've been reading the, the newspaper and it says there's record shootings in Chicago. And then I come here tonight and you don't want to put anyone in prison. Well, because prison doesn't actually reduce gun violence. Prosecutions don't reduce gun violence. Jobs reduce gun violence. Um, social workers reduce gun violence. Pre-trial diversion reduces gun violence. But like throwing everyone in prison just deprives socioeconomically disadvantaged communities of job earners and parents and babysitters and all of the things that they need to thrive. And so we have done this to ourselves, sort of as a society. All right. Let, one, 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 one. All right. Most important question of the night: Cubs or Sox fan? Oh, uh, Sox. <laughs> okay. Sox. Can I ask one? This isn't a private. We don't have private prisons in Chicago, right? Why not? But it, why does has that made a difference? No. With, I mean, you no. don't think it matters. Something like ten percent of prisons are private. So, like the prison industrial complex is a public problem. It is not a private problem. Where is that? Why is it well, yeah, yeah. $70,000 to keep an elderly person in prison because they have medical problems and they have health problems and they need, you know, I have a client right now who's on six different kinds of chemo and he's stuck in there, right? They, I have numerous clients who are in wheelchairs. I have a client who had a stroke and so he's not only in a wheelchair, he can't talk, right, feed himself, move at all. Right? Keeping that a person in that condition alive just takes a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. Over here. Mr. Travis. Uh, in the movies, uh, in the old days. Never a good way to start. <laughs> in, in the movies, in the old days, uh, they used to have prison baseball teams. Do they still have that? No. Not that I know of. Prison baseball. None that I know of. I guess it's hot. I don't know. Good question. Okay, any other questions? I think, isn't the trend toward removing education and books and things like that? It ebbs and flows. Again, I'm not focused on conditions because I really think the best thing we can do is just get people out of there. Ready for rebuttal. And then we have more money to educate the ones who are still there. Okay. Should we, should we done? There's two people behind. Okay, okay. Well, aren't a, a lot of, of the DNA lab reports are wrong, and people go to jail for that? 
Is that right? No. I heard it was. Okay. CNA is the one forensic science that public defenders as a general matter agree is generally accurate. There are different kinds of DNA, so whenever you get a mixture, there are some problems when we're talking about touch DNA, so the the like small quantities of DNA that you're at, that you leave behind epithelial cells, skin cells, those can be inaccurate. But if you're talking about like a pool of blood, that's a that's a pretty solid science that passes all the tests. What about OJ? He got convicted. <laughs> he didn't get convicted. He didn't get convicted. That's right. He didn't get convicted. All right. Yeah, that's that. Yeah. Last one. When you were talking about. Uh, how, how it's hard on the families yeah. because all the prisons are downstate. You would have to close half those downstate prisons and let's, put them all up on the south and west side. Let's just close the downstate prisons. Ta-da! Right, if we could reduce, let's just say we took out the 8,000 elderly people, right? Just the elderly people, we just let the elderly people go home. We could they close have some of them. several, they have not. So how, how do you define Well, that? that's where you, don't, you have to have a real rational system for letting the elderly out. We have no system, just literally none. They threw out a corrupt system instead of reforming it. Of parole, they did. They threw out a corrupt system. Yeah, but exactly if you put some common sense in, you could just... No, wait a minute. Legislation's not going to work on this one. Okay. But yeah, I'm all for, you know, a, a common sense system. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Give our speaker okay. a big hand. Sit down and enjoy the rebuttals. You'll get the chance to say the last word. We're going to have rebuttal periods. You get the last word. Okay. All right, Andy, please take over and let us know about our rebuttals. Okay, uh, raise your hands and keep the hands up so we can get an accurate count of who wants to give a rebuttal. One, two. Hey, all you guys back there, anybody want to give a rebuttal? Or Okay, get your hands up. One, two. Three, four, four on this side, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. I don't want to. Go well, four minutes apiece. All right. Well, start with who's up first. Why don't you go ahead and go up? You know, one of the things I'm going to say is that uh, what they're not looking at it. Uh, come, go, come on up, and we're going to read. countries. They, yeah, to in the average come time up to the mic. For murder in Germany is seven years, yeah. and they have a very low crime rate. Did you want to give a rebuttal or just make that statement? Just make that statement. Okay. Okay. All right, Mr. Travis. Thank you. Ah, uh, <clears throat> when a man and woman get married, uh, they're said to be one. And uh, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder and that sort of thing. And uh, so it is my contention that when a man goes to prison, that his uh, wife should be allowed to come and go as she pleases into the prison, sleep in the prison cell with her husband, sleep in the prison cell with her husband, uh, leave when she wants to, go and buy him a corned beef sandwich or whatever he wants, you know. Uh, but that's not the way they do it. The guy goes to prison and his wife at best can come and visit him once in a while. Only I think in the last 20 years have they come up with the idea of conjugal visits, which uh, some prisons I think have and most of them don't. So I think because of this, the homosexuality in the prisons uh, runs at a very high level. Uh, and I think that once that happens and it takes away a man's dignity, he, he drops lower and lower into the uh, pit of self-loathing and not caring, and then continuing to do worse and worse and worse. So uh, they talk about prison reform. Oh yeah, we've got prison reform that a lot of bleeding heart li liberals have provided. They, they have uh, law libraries and they have steam rooms and all kinds of things like that. But as for a real, genuine rehabilitation, we don't have that. 
I suspect that in uh, certain European countries, they probably have uh, prison reform that is far ahead of ours. Uh, Sweden probably does. Germany, maybe. Uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, countries like France and Italy, I'm told, are the absolute pits. So uh, we need a, uh, like a world tribunal to look at this matter <coughs> together and to conclude what needs to be done for genuine rehabilitation. Thank you. Oh boy, Dave. All right, Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's next? Yeah, you need reform. All right, get up. Reform. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, I love this free speech forum, and I think it is so important to um, give us a chance to, uh, you know, debate and um, let the dialectic process work, you know, so that we get a synthesis of ideas. Um, and thank you, Jennifer uh, Sobel. That was wonderful. Um, I really very impressive. Uh, I really admire what you've done. Um, I've been trying to figure out how to make a difference in this space for the last few years, and um, I, I particularly appreciate that you've done an analysis of you know, um, the legislative, uh, the judicial, the, um, what was the other one? The, uh, executive. Executive, yeah. Um, because we, with the Alliance Against Racist Political Oppression, at, you know, they've been at this for 45 years. I got in four or five years ago and as a volunteer as, and an analyst, and it seems that, um, that they're, they're not, it's not working, you know? I mean, it, it's, uh, it's hard to be uh, like to protest against racist uh, political police, you know, corruption, repression, um, because power and authority can, you know, be corrupt absolutely, and, and it is very hard for all these chanting, protesting people to um, to make a difference to it. It feels that way, but yet. I guess it's in the struggle, <laughs> you know, I've kind of learned to be a civil rights uh, struggler, um, you know, in the movement because, you know, I, I learned a lot, really, um, to the point that someone once said, you know, you should be in civil rights, and it, it, it was so removed from me that, um, you know, as someone who, I learned what social justice is by, ex understanding what justice is not <laughs> you don't get it it, it you know um, and I yeah, I'm very concerned about the police and the corruption that my analysis uh, identifies with the very very top um, you know when I, I I was hopeful about consent decree judicial consent decree will come in and uh, oversee the Chicago police and, um, you know, just have some basic uh, patterns and practices that are, you know, just make sure that the criminal behavior is eliminated, you know, rather than given immunity or covered up, you know. Um, we had the FOP come to our talk for Civilian Police Accountability Council, which would, is a great concept, you know, to have civilian community reform and overseeing and people could bring their complaints and we could investigate. Um, but the FOP, which has a lot of power coming from the top, um, Carlisle Group, who knows where, the, the guy that's running for district attorney now, his father is the Carlisle Group. No wonder he's got $2 million to run and capture the district attorney's office for the FOP to protect him. But the FOP said, we will have no accountability. None. They want zero, meaning they want to throw away all the complaints, all the records, all the data. Zero. They, this is called a police state, you know, and um, all the research I've done, I've got going back, this guy David Wise in the um, 70s, uh, you know, American police state. And, and I'm like, 
oh, this is a great book, you know. Why hasn't all these great books, all this knowledge changed anything? Um, it, it really absolute corruption corrupts absolutely. And I guess the arc of history can bend a little bit, but um, I despair, especially if the person at the very top has no will to reform. And, um, you know, we have a movement coming, the CFIS, civilian something like the committee to, with Ted Pearson, um, these are a bunch of the mothers of, of wrongfully convicted and tortured. By the way, those who were tortured, I brought um, Eugene Horton here. Um, he was one of our veterans who got out before we could help him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it was, that was a wonderful story, yeah. you know, and it is, I mean, there are um, great stories like that. Um, but, uh, I can't remember what I was saying, but Eugene, we, he came here, and um, we're, there's something going on. January 11th, he's going to get, he got 69 people out when he was in prison for 48 years, tortured by Burge. Um, now he's organizing to get other ones out, but he helped get 69 out. He's, he's just got a lot of energy, and um, on January 11th, it's going to be there, um, but he... Um, we do have his law office and things, but it, where was I going with this? That, uh, well, one good story about him, am I, uh, how much? Close. Rook, he, um, they didn't, I was at the Lovey and Lovey event, and they go, you, Jeannie Boy got out, and the way he got out is a veteran, one good veteran on the parole board, um, or whatever it was, uh, was also a veteran, understood PTSD, did the research, and that, kind of like 12 angry men, you know, advocated for Eugene to get out. You know, um, he, had, he wasn't expected to get out, right? But that, that's the story I thought could make a feel-good movie. Is that might be, be well, wrong with that. The, you, maybe you can speak to it. The parole board got a lot better. Thank you. And now everyone's going to go. What? Now everyone's going to go. Oh, they are? Oh, good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Helen. All right. I'm... Uh, something of a hard nose at times on this subject because as a reporter I have seen some stuff. I've been at murder scenes and in a couple of the cases I don't want to go into detail because there's a child here and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't subject anyone to that, what I, what I could tell you. But anyway, uh, at the same time I do believe that it is unnecessary to keep a lot of, especially the older prisoners, uh, in the jails. I also believe that there are a number of younger prisoners who don't need to be in the jails, but I would insist on one thing. <clears throat> if you're going to have a large-scale release of prisoners, I would suggest, and some people are going to think I'm nuts, job uh, availability plays a big role in whether or not a person commits a crime again. Therefore, I would suggest <clears throat> that uh, we require anyone leaving prison to have the equivalent of a high school degree and to have a skill that they can take with them when they leave so that they do not have to resort uh, to crimes. In many cases, <clears throat> in many states, they simply turn the prisoners loose, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, places like that aren't particularly noted for uh, education for prisoners. So, if you are concerned about real reform, I think you have to also be concerned about real marketable education for prisoners so that when they do leave the prisons, they never return except maybe to visit a buddy. Uh, <clears throat> It, it, it's, 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 it sounds crazy, I know, but the lady is right. We can't afford to be loading up our prisons with people who are not likely to commit crimes again. In the first place, when you're 75 years old, <clears throat> you're probably not going to be very good uh, at uh, strong-arm robberies. <clears throat> if you are 
you should probably be given a job at the prison as a prison guard. The question of prisons being located far from Chicago, <clears throat> a lot of people who live near prisons and who don't, have, who don't work at prisons and who don't have friends and relatives who work at prisons aren't particularly happy with a prison at their back door because occasionally people do escape from prisons and occasionally people are put at some peril because of that. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does and can happen. <clears throat> now, people living around Cook County Jail, for example, I've talked to a few of them uh, at various times for various reasons. They're not particularly happy with having Cook County Jail there because there have been escapes and there have been problems. I'm not saying we should move the Cook County Jail you know, out uh, to uh, Western Springs or some other place, but I am suggesting that maybe when, if we're talking about large-scale releases of prisoners, the prisoners even the prisoners that have uh, a right to a second chance should also be expected to be able to take care of themselves once they're released from prison. And, uh, you know, after, uh, after World War II, what did they do? They gave as many GIs as possible opportunities for college educations. For those who didn't have high school educations, and there were some, they gave them the opportunity for that. In this particular case, because they are prisoners, because they are under the control of the state until uh, their parole, well, we don't have that here. <clears throat> um, we, need, we need to have an intelligent approach to this, but at the same time, we can't turn a guy with a sixth grade education out on the streets and expect him to take care of himself. He can't. What we need to do is guarantee, I, I've often asked people, can you guarantee that these people will not recidivate? Chances are they will if we don't give them the ammunition necessary so that they don't have to go back to the joint. I don't know of too many people who uh, look upon their, their time in jail uh, you know, with, with any, any, any great affection. I think most of them are glad they are gone out of the jails. But we have to give the opportunity to these people or we're going to go bankrupt as a state. And these people, eventually, they are going to be released. They're eventually going to become wards of the state because we have kept them so long they can't get jobs. They can't do much of anything. We've got a responsibility here to ourselves. At the same time, we also have a responsibility to make damn sure we're not going to have real psychopaths walking down the streets after they've been released. If you're going to do this, you get one chance to do this. Otherwise, that whole program, I guarantee you, the politicians will shoot it down and change it forever. Thank you. If you can't do the crime, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Yeah. <laughs> Reinstate the death penalty. Yeah. There you go. You're up. All right. Oh, gosh. I agree. I'd like to thank our speaker for a very complimentary presentation. I agree with most of what she said, but not all of it. The decision by the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky was one of the most inane decisions I have ever heard. Yeah. You have to use a little discretion when you select people for, for pardon and for parole. And it appeared like he also pardoned a lot of people based on the amount of support that they gave to his campaign. Um, I'm sorry, that's not a rationale for pardon and parole. Even a fool like Moscow Mitch McConnell knew otherwise and said so. Um, And finally, with regard to Rod Blagojevich, a quote was just made from the theme song for Beretta that also applies here. Um, the most 
I would have done the president's shoes is reduced his sentence from 14 to 10 years. Because I think that's an adequate sentence for what Logo Average was accused of doing. As to the rest, well, he's innocent or he didn't do anything that anybody else didn't do for shit. He got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. And as they say on Barada, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Don't roll the dice if you can't pay the price. Well, because he chose to roll the dice, Lugoyevich and his whole family, now they are paying the price. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm, I'm uh, pro-police, pro and uh, I think this marijuana law, which went in effect January 1st, is really bad for, for Chicago and, and the country. That's yeah. for the state of Illinois. That's right. And uh, it lowers inhibitions. It's going to create vehicles tra and uh, crimes, crimes of c c c crimes. And uh, uh, the other thing I was going to say is this uh, Kim Fox, attorney, attorney general of Illinois, she says that uh, she's not going to prosecute any crimes under $1,000. Now, on Michigan Avenue, these kids, uh, are, that gives them license to go and, and they make sure they don't go over $1,000. And they go in these stores and they grab everything and they attack the tourists and, and, uh, and, and she won't pr prosecute. And uh, <clears throat> now the other thing is this uh, Van Dyke thing. I know he did an egregious crime, okay, he was found guilty of that. But still, when he's in jail, he shouldn't be attacked like that in the state of Illinois. And they have sent him to some other state now. And uh, he's an ex-police officer. And the other thing is uh, disrespect for police. How about in New York City? These people are throwing water at the police and disrespecting them. And, I, I, and it's really, I just hate to see that. And, and de Blasio, uh, if they say anything, that he'll, he'll, he'll uh, pr prosecute the police. Can you believe that? What? And, He'll prosecute the police. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 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 what do they think of next? The uh, <laughs> well, I back the police. The, the, the criminals have a, right, a lot of rights. They got uh, Miranda rights and due process. And uh, and uh, I, I go to the caps meetings, and everybody should go every once, at least once, and you'll see that. These police officers serve and protect, and they're trying their best, and uh, they, they can't, uh, they, they're having a hard time. Well, in, in, in this, uh, uh, in Chicago, the, the murder rate went down in, in the past year, so that's one good, good thing. But they had only had like a 10% uh, clear rate for murders, but now it's getting a little better. But anyway, I back the police. All right. He backs the police. Thank you very much. All right, let's thank our speaker. I didn't know you had a, a nascent organization there, right? Uh, it, was, it reminded me. Uh, anyhow, thank you for putting it together and trying to bring what you regard as to reform to the judicial system, which seems to have all sorts of views and opinions and corrective measures in place and the variety of opinions uh, regarding uh, uh, the only thing I'm going to talk about of the eclectic as usual but only on three topics tonight I'll be very relatively quick uh, when I think when we talk the topic is crime I think it's J.J. Jameson does everyone know who J.J. is? yeah I remember uh, J.J. J.J. Uh, Jameson? J.J. Jameson was a regular at the College Complex for about 20 years. As a matter of fact, he chaired the meeting, uh, one meeting uh, we, uh, at the Lincoln Restaurant. And then I was at work. Uh, actually, I was at work a bit late. And since I'm a federal employee, my number was publicly listed. I got a call from Boston. And they said, um, uh, your friend, J.J., you were seeking views and opinions. Your friend, J.J., was arrested, apprehended. He was escaped convict for double murder. And I said, no, you got the wrong guy. And no, they went into detail. And I said, no, his name was actually Norman Porter. But he had been at least 10 years to 20 years on an escaped convict. 
and had rehabilitated himself. And long well, story short, I ended up going to Boston to testify on his behalf at a parole, parole, parole hearing. Uh, he had made, and I was working on a literary project with him. We were writing a play together. But uh, I never ascertained anything, but I ever knew that he was, he had a, a dark past uh, regarding that. Okay, the other thing, I got a little more positive thing, but uh, the other thing I'll say about having sat through a number of things like this and worked with the Illinois Coalition Against the Death Penalty, among other organizations, is that the age 40 is the only thing you really got to remember. I believe, and you could challenge me on this, but once an individual turns to 40 years of age, their life of crime is over. And any, keeping anyone in, 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 in confinement beyond that age, I think is a complete waste of time and money. That basically carry that statistic with me. With you. That's why three times, three times, uh, uh, and your outlaws are, are invalid because they put people in prison at the very time when they're like to give up a life of crime. But it seems to be the age of 40 maturation kicks in for something, and they're not likely to commit a life of crime. The other thing is, uh, as a representative of CTA passengers, this topic often comes up uh, regarding crime on CTA. And I'm going to give you this fact here. You are safer on the street, you are safer on CTA and on public transit than you are on the street. We even put together a report a few years ago for one of the TV stations on this topic. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you leave like a station, uh, that's when you may have some problems. We actually complained about one bus stop at a station that it was half a block or a block away uh, from the bus station, and that was putting people in the precarious situations. But uh, I've been posting something on social media this week. It's a, which seat do you want to sit on uh, in public transit? A lot of people mention crime. But uh, and I'm putting this, and I'm going to tell you this right now. I've testified at numerous public hearings, Metro, Pace, <laughs> CTA, different locations around the metropolitan area, regional transportation authority, and I've yet to have anyone come forward, a passenger, uh, to give a complaint or lodge a complaint regarding security and safety on public transit as an issue that should be addressed. I can't even think within the past 10 years if ever. Uh, they, granted, it's not perfect. Crimes are going to take place. Uh, things are going to happen. It's got over half a million passengers that operate uh, eight, 24 hours a day. Uh, and there's good guys and bad guys and people who misbehave and so forth. But on the whole, I stand by my statement and assertion that you're safer on public transit than you are on the street. Anyhow, thank you very much for coming. Please come back and give us another report on progress you made towards uh, bringing justice to the state of Illinois. Hey, Charlie, 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 thank you. Yeah. What became of J.J. Davison? Or still what? in. What? Still in. Prison. Yeah, he's still no. in prison. The one thing that was kind of sad, he had, I left out of the story was, the only reason, it was a cold case, the only reason he got thrown back in was that he had a, there, there was a cousin out east who was bound to determine, she gave her life. I don't even know why, she wasn't even that closely related to victims or anything. There was some question of whether or not he had committed the murder was accessory. That's why he was, he was so, but he had, this cousin was bound to determine that J.J. get apprehended. She dedicated her life to this. She was maniacal. I don't know, and the sad thing was he had, had made something of a romantic relationship, which obviously they couldn't pursue after he was incarcerated, which uh, wasn't the most positive part of it. I also was, All right, sure. one more thing, I was contacted to be on national television about this. To today's show. I declined to get on there. I didn't. 
I didn't want to bring the college in. All right, thank Thanks. you. All right. All right. Since when have you ever Hello, uh, have hi. You ever my refused name is Rose Bowman, and I think it's a great topic. I really <laughs> enjoyed yeah. um, all the statistics that Jennifer uh, has brought up, and I applaud her activism because it's so easy just to be in the background and not to do anything about it. Of course, you know, who, who wants to be inconvenienced and inconvenience and do something. It, it takes work, of course, nonstop, day after day after day after day. The days turn into years, years turn into decades, and so on and so forth. Activism, activism takes a lot out of you because it comes from your heart. Well, anyway, I agree with her, and um, I think there are too far too many people in, in prison. This is not a way. This is not a way in order to rehabilitate anyone um, on a long-term basis. How could anybody be rehabilitated after being there, after one damn year? Come on, after one week, come on. Can any of you really survive mentally, emotionally? I, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed how people do it on an everyday, everyday basis for years, decades. I, I, I'm, my heart really, I can't even see those shows really, those, um, those prison shows, really, I can't even see those shows because they take so much out of me emotionally to see that on a day in, day out basis, the life, anyway. Um, I am so glad, yes, for um, the governor pardoning, pardoning all those marijuana um, offenders. I applaud him, and yes, marijuana should have been um, um, allowed, it should never have been banned as far as I'm concerned. As far as I'm concerned. Thank you. I feel at liberty tonight to talk about one of the most effective uh, reform for uh, prisoners and the way of turning around their lives. I go back to the Watergate hearings and a gentleman by the name of Charles Colson who said something called prison fellowship. And that is basically having prisoners turn their lives around to Jesus Christ and then having them lead better lives both in and out of prison. I will be going tomorrow morning to Springbrook Community Church where I too am a believer in Jesus Christ and I also know that when these reforms and philosophies are followed, that is probably one of the best ways to see prisoners and non-prisoners alike turn their lives around. I think we need a lot more in this country with just the values that Christians have. Love thy neighbor as thyself, and love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And what Charles Colson did with his prison fellowship has probably done just as much to turn around many lives of prisoners, both in and out. And I also think that something we should also consider for our own lives. Thank you. What about those prisoners that are Jewish? I still want to know why everyone's smoking dope now. Once again, I'd like to thank Jennifer for a brilliant presentation tonight. We covered a lot of ground. It's kind of like trying to stuff 50 pounds of potatoes into a 20 pound sack, right? <laughs> Once you dry away, you say, I should have said this, should have covered that. You can only cover so much. Uh, you can't cram a four hour presentation into an hour. But uh, you've done a brilliant job uh, so far, it sounds like. Um, I'd like to make a few comments that maybe uh, other people haven't touched upon. We try to add something that other people haven't said. Well, there's an old saying, you know, that a fish rots from the head. <laughs> and um, if you look at the difference between America and Norway in the justice system, in Norway, they have a sense of uh, universal respect for life and human beings. In America, prisoners are considered disposable, throwaway, after they're in. Uh, for those of you that haven't been watching the news lately, about an hour ago, I checked uh, the website Common Dreams. They're posting hourly now. President Trump, if you can call him president, that's like having a plumber 
in charge of the brain surgery department at the Mayo Clinic and calling him head of the brain surgery department. Donald Trump is no kind of president. He's totally unfit. He's been bringing disgrace to that office and he's doing the bidding of a group of people, billionaires, that have no ethics, no morals, and no conscience. But war is very, very profitable. So Donald Trump has just put out a statement saying they've identified 52 sites in Iran that they're going to start bombing immediately if the Iranians don't stand down from the offensive things they've been doing to America. So if you think we should have another 15 or 20 year war like Iraq and Afghanistan, and the military hardware funneling back into our police communities all over the country, and more police being empowered just to shoot people in the back if they happen to be of a certain skin color, one, I, I saw recently a question he was asking at the speech. He said, can you identify one white person that's been shot in the back and gunned down by police nationwide? Anybody can name one white person. There's a whole lot of black people who have been shot in the back, running away. Some have been shot on the ground. A fish rots from the head. And since late 1970s, beginning in about 1980, this country has drifted toward right-wing authoritarian bent where ordinary people are considered not worthy of the Bill of Rights, any kind of universal justice. That's what's going on in America right now. So what Jennifer is talking about is one of the symptoms of this whole philosophy. And this is not something new. Uh, those of us that went to Sunday school or were forced to go to Sunday school, all kinds of different religions, they say, Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Yep. Um, well, we're seeing wolves running our country right now. They're hand-picked. People with no ethics, no morals, and no conscience are in charge of the U.S. government right now. And we outweigh those people a million to one. For every one of them, there's about a million of us. What are we going to do about it? Edmund Burke was famous for saying, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Horace Mann left a quote. He said, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity, working for positive things. I would suggest that everybody check out or get your own personal copy and loan it to people of Michael Moore's movie called Where to Invade Next. <laughs> Has anybody seen that? Yes. Anybody seen it? Yes. He talks about, he got a whole bunch of flags. He said that the main, the general said our wars in the Middle East haven't been going well, so couldn't you help us out? So Michael Moore told him, stand down, just stop killing people. I'll get a bunch of American flags, and I'll invade some countries quietly and plant the flag, plant the flag and steal a good thing without killing anybody. So he planted the flag in a bunch of different countries. They had universal health care, uh, you know, school uh, lunches in France. Uh, restorative justice in Norway, and at the end of that movie he said, every one of these things that these countries have adopted, we all had those things at some state at some time in America. They got those ideas from us and ran with it because it made tremendous sense. So um, there's a nationwide movement. As I said, I got heckled mercilessly back in January for talking about the student movement started by Greta Thunberg. Well, Greta Thunberg was just made the person of the year on the cover of Time. And there's about, the latest count, it's estimated to be between five and six million students in 150 countries that are out of school every Friday protesting for the future. And it's not just about the future, it's about the overall concept of justice that you're talking about here. The Green New Deal is about restoring, uh, name, you know, Klein wrote the book, this changes everything. Say, we fix the climate problem, you free up trillions of dollars to solve all these other problems that we have now, right? So uh, that's what the, I'll, I'll be giving a talk on uh, April 24th on the Green New Deal, how to pay for it and how it will change society and maybe give our kids a shot at having a decent future beyond 2050. Yeah. Right now, the, the, the window of opportunity is 2030. It won't matter what we do after 2030 if we don't get our act together right now and do something to stop the ice melting at the north and south. That's Pole. why we need thorium. 
Well, that too. We'll talk about that later. But at any rate, uh, thank you again, Jennifer, for a brilliant presentation. And uh, if you've been making notes at all, you can answer some of the criticisms. If you choose, uh, come on up and you get, you the, get last the last word. word. Things that you Let's thank our speaker say. again for a well-informed, well good presentation. Yes. So I only heard four things that I thought were relevant to what I said. <laughs> the first is Kim Fox uh, and the $1,000 threshold. What Kim Fox, and it's not even relevant, I just thought I should correct it. All across the country, the threshold for felony theft is higher than it is in Illinois. In Illinois, it's $250 or $300, I can't remember. But that's really, really low. In all of the neighboring states, it's a lot more. So what Kim Fox said is that she was only going to prosecute for felony theft if the amount stolen was more than $1,000. If it's less than $1,000, she didn't say she wasn't going to prosecute it as a theft. She just said she was going to prosecute it as a felony. I think it's a really important distinction because of the serious difference in consequences between a felony prosecution and a misdemeanor prosecution. The gentleman who talks about education, I totally agree. I couldn't agree more. The purpose of prison should be rehabilitation. There should be no other reason that anyone should be incarcerated. If you're going to put someone in prison, they should come out better than, what, than they went in. A hundred percent. At the moment, most prisoners don't get any education. They don't get much vocational training, and it's about money. Um, I would love nothing more than for us to free up resources so that everybody who was in was actually getting some benefit. Um, so I'm totally on board, and a program like this could help find some funds to do something like that. Um, Mr. Horton, so happy he's out, so happy he's out. I do think that part of the reason he's out is because the makeup of the PRB has changed. There were three vacancies after Rauner left. Um, Governor Pritzker filled those vacancies with really good people. And now the PRB is letting out people in significant numbers in a way that they never have before. At the hearing in November, where I represented two people, four of the five people up there, which is like completely unheard of. So it's no dig on this work. He is wonderful. Um, but I do think there is reason to be hopeful about the role of the PRB going forward and that they really can be an instrument for thoughtful change. Um, Oh, and the, I think it was Charlie who said that everybody should get out at 40 years. I totally agree. I picked 50. Maybe it was Charlie. Somebody said 40 years. That age out of crime at 40 years. It's absolutely right. All of the research suggests that people stop committing crimes around that age, um, and that crime is very much a function of brain immaturity and sort of hormones, which makes a lot of sense. By the time you're 40, your brain is fully cooked. Brains do not stop developing. The latest research suggests until 30. Um, there's a lot of research that used to say 18, and then the research said 21. And as our neuroimaging um, abilities get better, we are able to observe more and more changes that continue to take place all the way into the 30s, which is why 40 people are pretty much done doing stupid. Most people are done doing most stupid things. Um, so that's it. Thank you guys so much for coming. All right. All right. And the Pamela Saladay. Some people are evil. Very few people are evil. Very few. All right. Very few. That's it. Some of those aren't a Again, um, for what, did they call the what Jennifer was talking about, the best example of that is Norway's restorative justice program. So check that out. And we are adjourned. We'll see you next week. Google him. You can find my op-ed on him.